Welcome everyone to another edition of the Future Dams webinar series. To all of you guys, that if this is your first webinar, Future Dams uh, webinar, just wanted to give a brief introduction to Future Dams. Uh, we're a consortium of over 30 researchers developing the knowledge base, tools, and approach for designing interventions and systems to support resilient and sustainable development. You can find all the information about our research project at our website, futuredams.org. And uh, we host these webinars once every two or three weeks. We're trying to put together the program for the rest of May and leading into the summer as well. You'll find more information about that uh, on our website as well. Today, we're excited to have Judith Plummer Brakeman and Sara uh, Sana Markinen from Cambridge presenting some of their work. Uh, I'd like to give a brief, brief introduction before we move on to their presentation. Judith got years of experience working on large infrastructure and engineering projects in developing countries uh, with the broad aim of bringing sustainable improvements and living reductions in poverty. And her principal area of expertise is in structuring, financing, and economic development of infrastructure utilities and projects. Sana has also got an extensive experience with policy evaluation and social policy research. And her recent work is focused on energy efficiency and social and economic impact of transition to low carbon economy. Uh, they're both at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainable Leadership. Uh, and they're also working with Future Dams Research Consortium, broadly exploring global capital flows and how they can influence the emergence of most more sustainable hydropower infrastructures. I'll hand it over to you, Sana. Um, thank you very much, much Roshan. Um, and thank you very much, um, all of you joining us this afternoon. Um, as Roshan mentioned, um, what Judith and I will be presenting today um, is work that is drawing on our contribution to the Future Dams um, research project. Um, this is um, work from ongoing research. We'll be talking about financing large hydropower projects with a focus specifically on low and lower middle income countries. Um, and we'll focus um, in these presentations specifically on why private sector involvement matters, what the benefits might be, um, and how um, risk becomes an important question for us to look at in this context. Um, so the three questions that my presentation is going to address is uh, why do we need more hydropower? Why that is something that we ought to think about? Um, why the different financing um, structures or models matter? Why does financing matter overall? It's not just a matter of getting financing for new projects. There are um, benefits and disadvantages to different types of financing, and that's something that countries will need to consider, especially when we talk about lower and lower middle income countries. Um, and also, I'm going to talk a bit about why more private sector involvement could be beneficial. And this is not to say that it definitely is always beneficial. Uh, it's more of a question of whether it could be um, beneficial and how we could potentially incentivize more good quality private sector investment in hydropower. Uh, Judith and I are looking specifically large hydropower projects um, and the starting point is very much the thought that hydropower um, can be an important tool for socio-economic development. Um, first of all, hydropower is a major source of renewable electricity. Um, currently, it accounts for about 16% of all electricity generated globally and um, it remains by far the largest um, source of renewable electricity worldwide um, and it can be used to improve electricity access rates especially in low-income countries uh, with low um, electric electrification rates and as such it can be an important tool for economic growth. Um, hydropower can provide large-scale low-cost uh, renewable energy for cities and industries um, it's also a very stable um, electricity supply, which is especially important for industrial um, development in countries that are frequently experiencing blackouts. It can also support greater integration of intermittent renewables um, into the grid. So um, intermittent renewables such as solar and wind, um, it will be easier to increase their um, and increase these technologies in the grid connections 
um, when hydropower can provide the role of uh, grid stability um, as well as a storage function. Um, Multi-purpose uh, multi dams can also provide other benefits such as irrigation, flood control and water storage. Uh, water storage in particular, but also irrigation and flood control are particularly important in countries um, where the, re the, the rainfall is very seasonal and uh, you might get rainfall once or twice a year, um, a lot of rain over a period of one or two months. Um, I am now in a situation where I can't see the last point, but I benefit, um, I believe that it is sustainable development goals. Um, and by addressing all of these issues that um, I mentioned on this slide, um, large scale hydropower can enable countries to progress towards sustainable development goals, primarily sustainable development goal number seven. Uh, which is renewable electricity access for all, um, but also through addressing that sustainable development goals and um, improve progress towards um, sustainable development goal one to um, improving employment, sustainable employment for large numbers of people uh, and do all of this in the way that is compatible with the environmental targets also listed in the sustainable development goals. Sorry, I forgot to mention here that at the moment, much of the technically feasible um, hydropower potential is located in low and middle income countries. Um, and a lot of this hydropower potential in these countries is currently untapped. In Nepal, for example, electrification rates are below 50% in most parts of the country, whereas 90% um, of the um, hydropower potential that is technically feasible is currently not being utilized. So this is a, this is a very big potential uh, for sustainable development in many countries. And when it comes into different ways that projects can be financed, uh, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to this um, in, the, in the way of giving you a talk, um, tale of three dams. Uh, these three dams are located in Uganda um, on the river um, on the White Nile, um, flowing from Lake Victoria. Um, all of this is available in a lot more detail in um, our most recent publication that is available on the Future Dams website, so I'll try to not go into that much detail. Um, the first dam um, is Nalda Bali, so I'm going from the bottom of the screen simply because that's the way that I can get the map and the images to work. So Nal Bali is a 180 megawatt dam. It was commissioned in 1954. Um, it was fully public sector financed. The initial construction in 1950s was financed um, by the UK government under colonial times. Um, well, most of the materials were imported from Europe. The dam took seven years from concept to commission, including a three-year construction period. Um, it was later extended um, so there is a 200 megawatt extension called Kira, uh, which is about one kilometer away from Nalabali, um, just um, on the same point of the river, just at the mouth of the White Nile. Um, at the same time, um, when, um, when the Kira addition was made, primarily with funding from uh, World Bank, the original Nalabali station was extended from 150 megawatts to 180. So if we then move up, um, the second dam is Bujagali. Um, it's about 10 kilometers or so down the river um, from Nalabali. 250 megawatts was commissioned in 2012. It is a public-private partnership project, and I will show you the details of that in a few minutes. Um, it's on a 30-year concession, so a private sector company is, um, is in ownership of the project for the first 30 years after commissioning, um, and then it will transfer to the Ugandan government ownership for the value of one dollar. Um, it took 18 years from concept to commissioning, and this is largely because the first financing package fell through, and there were concerns about social and environmental impact assessment and mitigation, um, and there was a corruption scandal, which led to their main investors pulling out um, before the whole financing uh, package had been 
um, and later on um, a new financing arrangement was put in place with slight modifications to how the project was, um, was put together. The cost estimate uh, was in 2007 when the construction finally commenced about 580 million US dollars and in the end in 2012 the estimate is that the project actually cost about 1.3 billion US dollars to build. Um, this led to high electricity costs uh, which were later addressed through refinancing which is I, I will also show you um, how that process worked. Um, and then finally on the top we have 183 megawatts um, dam called Isimba. It's about 40 kilometers up the river um, from Puchigali, sorry, down the river from Puchigali. Um, it was commissioned in 2018. And the project was financed using the so-called new bilateral financing model uh, with 85% of the costs covered by um, China Exim Bank. Um, all equity is held by the government of Uganda, so they had to put uh, put in that 15% uh, of the total cost. Um, it took less than 10 years from concept to closure, but again, this was a situation where initially um, the Ugandan government had different plans on who ought to be financing this project. Um, and it was only five years, no, six years. Um, so in 2012, that they decided to, uh, to, to award the project to um, the Chinese construction. Um, contractors. Um, the total cost was approximately 568 million US dollars. So as you can see, um, these projects are slightly different size, but not massively so. Um, in particular, there is a substantial cost difference if you look at the cost per megawatt um, between Isimba and Bujigali. And I will now show you very briefly um, how the financing packages for these two projects look like and then I'll talk a bit about the pros and cons of both financing approaches. So this is Bujagali financing structure. As you can see if you look at the top of the screen, equity comes from both private sources and public sector as in Ugandan government. Together these private sector investors and the Ugandan government formed Bujagali Energy Limited or Bell. Um, the Bell was awarded 30 year concession, so they were in ownership of the project for 30 years under the build, own, operate transfer contract. So after the 30 years, the project will transfer ownership to the Ugandan government. Um, when the first financing package fell through, um, the Ugandan government decided to break the Bujavali project into two separate but interconnected projects. So this is the Bujavali hydropower project on the right, um, BHP, uh, which is the actual hydropower station. And then there is the Bujavali interconnection project, which was a grid extension to evacuate the power to larger numbers of people across Uganda. Um, the Bujavali interconnection project was fully public sector funded, so getting a concessional lending from AFDB, so African Development Bank, as well as the um, Japan Bank for International Cooperation. The Puchakali Hydropower Project, on the other hand, had several different financing uh, financiers providing debt for the project. So you have IFC, IFDB private sector window, European Investment Bank, several different bilateral organisations, through their public sector window as well as their private arms. Um, and in the risk mitigation at the bottom of the screen, you can see either partial risk guarantee, um, mega political risk, guarantee, uh, political risk insurance, as well as the Ugandan government sovereign guarantee. So in order to get the IDA and MEGA um, guarantees, as many of you may know, um, the Ugandan government has to provide a sovereign guarantee However, because the MBB guarantees through IDA and MEGA are available for these kinds of projects, only 25% of the total cost will go into the Ugandan government balance sheet. So once the project was operational, um, there were concerns about the high cost of electricity derived from this project. And subsequently, Ugandan government decided to refinance the project. And this is obviously a decision that Bell had to be involved in. It was Bell's decision in the end 
Um, and the financing package was successfully put together in the end. It wasn't easy, but it was possible. Um, this fin refinancing package involved more than 400 million um, US dollars in loans, uh, being refinanced to a consortium that included many of the original lenders, um, including two of the commercial banks. Um, the original um, MEGA guarantee, um, sorry, the original IDA partial risk guarantee remained in place, as well as the Ugandan sovereign guarantee. Um, and there were new guarantees, including MEGA political risk guarantee uh, for 20 years that was made available to the equity investors. And after this refinancing package was agreed, um, the major equity share, as you can see on the top of the screen, um, S and Power AS, which is a Norwegian company, purchased um, the majority shares um, of this project. So, in comparison to the complexity shown in the previous two slides, um, this is the financing structure for the Isimba, which was the third dam that I discussed that was um, um, about 55 kilometers down the river from Lake Victoria. It was commissioned in 2019, uh, 2018. Um, very simple. Um, Ugandan government owns all the equity, which is 15% of the total project costs and China Export Import Bank, or so-called China Exim Bank, um, gave debt for the 85% of the total cost of the project. Um, it took five years to build, and um, the cost was 567.7 million, or roughly 568 million US dollars. So, when low-income countries figure out how to um, develop new energy generation infrastructure for development needs. Um, these are very much the two options that they have. Um, public sector finance is increasingly unavailable, especially to cover a large proportion of the project costs. And this process is discussed in more detail um, also in our latest paper uh, with Judith. So, in one, on one hand, uh, the new bilateral finance, as you can remember, very simple structure. It's simple. Uh, being simple makes it quick. And uh, being quick means that it tends to be lower cost. Um, the project is from the start in the government ownership. So in this case, it's in, but was in the Ugandan government ownership uh, from the very start. Um, there are no dividend payments for shareholders because there is no special purpose company, as there was in the case of the Chikali. Um, and this also means that the government is free to set the electricity tariffs. Um, in principle, or in theory, this means that the government can set electricity tariffs low enough to make them accessible to local consumers. However, it also means that the government can also choose simply to sell the electricity to other countries. Um, in terms of disadvantages of the new bilateral finance model, um, the host country has very limited choice over materials um, and there is very limited competitive procurement process. Most of the financing, the debt financing from Exim banks, whether they are Chinese, Korean, Brazilian or what have you, um, is generally tied to purchasing goods, materials, technology, and even labor from the country from which this finance comes from. So there is very limited scope for uh, competitive procurement. The government must make an equity contribution. They are the sole equity, um, sole equity shareholder. Um, and this entire balance is going to show in the country's balance sheet. Similarly, the government takes on the entire cost of the debt um, and sole responsibility for paying it, 100% of that debt is going to show in the country's balance sheet. This might become a bigger problem in the future um, when, when the, the COVID-19 um, impacts are better known and we'll find out more about um, how different financiers um, with large amounts of debts to developing countries will actually deal uh, with providing any breaks from payments 
Um, similarly, this can be a big issue if country borrows a lot of money for several um, projects simultaneously. And again, that is discussed in more detail uh, in our latest paper. Um, there is a need to increase the capacity in countries that um, acquire financing um, from um, exim banks for these kinds of projects because the amount allowance um, and the host countries are responsible for negotiating conditions um, with the financiers. So they need to be able to know what they can ask, know what they can't ask, um, and therefore be able to make the deal as good as possible for their countries. Um, there is a risk that social and environmental impact safeguards are overlooked or not inappropriate, uh, not appropriately addressed. Um, this is primarily because there is no external oversight on these projects. Exim bank financing tends to agree that it is the sole responsibility of the host country uh, to um, look into the social and environmental impacts, decide how to address them, um, and then follow through um, with the plans. Um, and not all developing countries have much capacity to really do this um, pro to carry out this process um, appropriately. And finally, but um, not least importantly, there is the risk of foreign ownership. Um, so foreign countries seizing these assets um, if the country defaults on debt repayments. In terms of public-private partnership, on the other hand, if we look at the benefits on the right of the screen top box, um, a lot of these benefits tend to be um, um, addressing the shortcomings of the new bilateral finance model. So again, these models enable new infrastructure to be developed, even in countries with low credit rating. Um, it, these projects can go ahead, even when there is limited availability of concessionary lending from multinational development banks, um, and the government is able to make only minimal investment. Um, PBPs don't generally increase government debt because the debt is all issued to a special purpose company. Um, the long-term gains from these projects will eventually occur, uh, accrue to the host country government, although it might be 20 or 30 years farther down the line. Um, one of the benefits is that very few projects go ahead without any MDB involvement. Um, and MDB involvement can be useful to and make sure that sustainability, sustainability protocols um, in line with international standards of best practice are being enforced and, and are followed through. Um, and also PPPs um, can be refinanced, whereas it's a lot more difficult, if not impossible, for new bilateral finance projects. Um, however, there are some significant shortcomings, um, and we have included three main shortcomings here. Um, first of all, the large number of financiers or investors means that these projects are slow. And the reason why many of these projects have very large numbers of financiers or investors is that generally private sector investors are not willing to invest very large amounts of, of, their, of their resources or invest a substantial proportion of the overall costs of the project because they're just not willing to take that risk in markets that they consider volatile or they're less familiar with. And hydropower generally is regarded as fairly risky investment. However, the complexity uh, of the PPP financing structures, as I showed you using the Bujagali example, is that these projects are very slow to put together they require several different agreements between the different financiers um, and the process is slow and convoluted. Um, in some instances, you have um, projects being trying to achieve financial closure um, by some of the actors such as shareholders taking multiple roles. Um, and there is an example of this um, in our latest paper from Nantum 2 um, in the Republic of Laos. Um, where some of the um, some of the shareholders were also the off-taker um, for the contractor for the project, and this can raise some questions about transparency. 
Um, and also private sector involvement means that you have a special purpose company that is for profit um, and the company being for profit may push up price of electricity and um, it's also quite difficult in many instances to get private sector investment um, to fund the electricity distribution infrastructure or the development of new electricity distribution infrastructure. However, what we discovered when we were doing this research with Judith is that many of, the, of these key shortcomings of PPPs um, are real challenges, but they can be addressed um, through different mechanisms. Um, and there is a previous paper uh, where we look at all of these in, in much more detail. Um, by far the biggest challenge to PPPs um, and one that is often pushing low-income countries or developing countries away from the PPP is the complexity of the financing structures and the slow nature of the process. Um, and what Judith is going to be talking about, um, as I hand over to her in just half a minute, um, is how better understanding of risk and risk mitigation could actually bring in more private sector investment, increase the confidence of private sector investors to invest in these projects in larger quantities of money, making um, the financing structure for PPPs um, simpler, quicker, um, and therefore cheaper. Um, so I am now going to hand over to Judith. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sana. Um, as Sana said, I'm now going to take you through the risk modelling that we've been doing for hydropower finance. And um, what we have been discovering is that really risk is, is all that finance is about when it comes to hydropower. Um, there, there is not a shortage of finance for infrastructure, but there is a shortage of finance which has the kind of risk appetite which it needs in order to enter a low income country to finance a large dam. So we set about trying to work out what was necessary in order to try to improve the rate of financing, particularly the rate of private participation in financing. And um, Sana talked briefly about refinancing and absolutely there's a key issue here, depending on whether you're talking about a greenfield site or a dam that's already constructed. And the attitude for private investment in a constructed dam is completely different to the attitude for um, financing construction. But largely what we're talking about here at the moment is financing construction, because it is construction finance that these countries are short of. So this um, framework, analytical framework for risk, starts simple and works up to quite complex. So bear with me. Um, first of all, we divided the risk into four main areas. Uh, government risk, environmental and social risk, technical risk and financial risk. And um, then we took for each of those areas six key metrics of risk which were relevant for those particular areas. And if we take each of those quadrants in turn for environmental risk, now it's really important to note here that what we were trying to do was take a financier's perspective. So there are lots of different stakeholders to a financial, um, to the financing of a hydropower project. There are lots of different stakeholders to the development of a hydropower project. And some of them, particularly perhaps the, the local people living near a dam site, you know, cultural heritage might be the biggest risk from their perspective. But from a financial perspective, it's much more nuanced, it's much more generalized, and there doesn't tend to be one key risk which is way and above more important than the others. Hydropower projects are absolutely site specific, and as a result, they have a site specific set of risks. 
So you can't say that for every hydropower project, this particular risk is the biggest concern to financiers. Although payment risk would probably come close to being that. So we divide each quadrant down into six key areas. And I think government risk was perhaps the area that we have found um, which surprised most people, shall we say, that um, issues like the responsiveness to government to the, their holding up their side of a development was really one of the key risks. And they, there was a study done some time ago in Brazil where um, the World Bank looked at what it took to get the environmental license for a hydropower project in Brazil. And um, in some places they were looking at six months just to get the terms of reference approved for the environmental impact assessment, even though the terms of reference were pretty much standardized. So those kind of delays are things which um, developers are simply not prepared to take and financiers cannot go along with them. There are some risks here which when talking to financiers about this, we found were simply risks which meant they would walk away. It wasn't an issue of how can we mitigate this risk, it was just an issue of we're not going to go there. And transboundary disputes were significant in that. If there were um, civil unrest or border disputes close to a project, then it was likely to mean that financiers would simply walk away. Now, financial risks, you would think, would be the most significant for financiers. And in some ways they are, but in other ways, the financiers that we spoke to said that these were the risks they understood best. And as a result, perhaps they were the risks that weren't such a concern to them because they did understand them. They actually found things like technical risk, which they understood less well, of greater concern than the financial risks. That doesn't mean to say they don't try to mitigate all of them. And in fact, in earlier research that I did, looking at what mitigation measures were taken, I found that special purpose companies set up to develop hydropower projects were basically mitigating everything they could. Because mitigation is quite difficult. There are many risks which can't be mitigated. So if they found something they could do to mitigate a risk, they tended to do it. So putting that all back together, we have a basic framework for establishing the analysis of risk from a financier's perspective. What we then did was to consider how each of those risks actually affect the financier. And this is interesting because for the top half set of risks, the government and the environmental social risks, they can create a business risk. When some of these risks first start to go wrong, they have a greater impact on the reputation of the financier than they do on the actual credit risk of not being paid. So if you have a project which has perhaps damaged a cultural heritage asset, the actual cost of putting that right may not be huge, but the reputational risk of it having happened can be really significant. And this is the sort of issue over which companies get people campaigning at their annual general meetings. So initially some of these risks can cause a business risk rather than the credit risk. But ultimately as each risk gets worse, the worse it gets the more likely it is to affect the credit risk, i.e. to affect the likelihood that that financial will be repaid. So then we looked at what mitigation is available. And first of all, it has to be said that one of the key issues of mitigation for most companies is their own strategy. And we have literally been in meetings where financiers said to us, no, we don't do Africa. And they have just taken the decision that areas that they don't know well are too difficult to invest in, 
and they're not interested in entering any new areas at the moment. So there are individual risk mitigations taken. But what is it that the actual um, project can do to mitigate risk? Well, the risk mitigations which can keep financiers happy are really the same risk mitigations you would do to keep any stakeholder happy. Um, on the environmental and social side, you're talking about social and environmental impact assessment. On the government side, you're talking about government commitments to action, international water sharing agreements, international guidance. On the technical side, you're talking about using quality construction contractors and best practice in terms of recruitment and um, site exploration. Everything at using the best practice available within the sector. From the financial point of view, there are really some quite well-known uh, ways in which you can limit the financial risk. But there are some risks here which are really hard to mitigate. Something like foreign exchange risk. Yes, there are things that you can do. You can try to match the payments of your debt to the payment currency of the electricity. But if you can't, then something like financial hedging can be very expensive. So there are um, mitigations here. Some of them are, are severely limited. So again, if we put the whole framework back together, you can see that it's now developed from quite a simple core to quite a complex outside edge. And over top of that, we can then consider if you're not looking risk by risk, but segment by segment, what other mitigation can you do? And it tends to be government guarantees. Government guarantees, government commitments, a functional legal and regulatory framework, and quality contracting preparation and investigations, and linkages to everything else that's going on in the economy. Linkages to water sector strategies, for instance. On top of that, these government guarantees can be backed up by MDB guarantees, backed up by insurance and um, export guarantees, for instance. So there's a wide range of mitigation that can be brought in. Now, we're running quite short of time, so I'm going to stop there. The full details of um, the two papers we've already published are noted here. There will be two, <coughs> excuse me, two more papers coming out looking at risk in the next few months. So please watch this space. Thank you very much. <laughs>